Let's do uh, 2 Corinthians 2. Let's look at verse 10 and 11. Go back. I guess maybe go back to verse 9. For to this end also I wrote that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. But when you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed what I have forgiven, if I have forgotten anything, I did it for your sake in the presence of Christ. In order that no advantage be taken of us by, the, by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. If you may not be aware of the background of chapter 2. The background to chapter 2 came out of 1 Corinthians, that 5 passage where uh, somebody in the church had gotten engaged in an immoral act that even the unbelievers were uneasy with, if you recall that. And the church was ignoring the sin over the principle of grace. They were ignoring sin over the principle of grace. Well, you know, privacy and grace and all that. And he said, look, you've got to separate that from that person socially. I mean, he's got to be, that we're not cooperating with that. I mean, we're not, um, we're, we're not going to give consent under that type of behavior. And he wasn't coming out of it. And they weren't encouraging him to come out of that behavior. <clears throat> and so they brought uh, the discipline. I mean, he could go to church, but nobody would, nobody would socialize with him outside of church. Are you with me? <clears throat> and the church finally responded to that. And he finally repented and corrected these behaviors in his life. And the church wasn't welcoming him back into a fellowship uh, social program of the church. Do you remember that story? And now Paul has to go back and clean up on the backside of it. <laughs> and that's chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians. And what he's talking about, you've got to have a loving, forgiving spirit with this person when they, when they confess their sin and move away from it and now are beginning to exemplify the character of Christ, they, they need to be brought back into complete full. That is the way forgiveness and love and grace works. And so he comes, and so we're in the middle of that in, in our study on the angelic conflict. And so I, I want to pick up nine when he says, for this end also I wrote that I might put you to the test that first Corinthians, whether you are obedient in all things, but whom you forget, give anything. See, that's what he's now talking about. I forgive also for indeed what I have forgiven. If I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sake in the presence of Christ. And, and here's the angelic conflict in this. In order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his schemes. In other words, we, we've got to be, we got to know when to forgive. And I mean, it wasn't ours to forgive him, quote, in the true sense of the word, as far as his sin, but his behavior type of thing. And so the writer, what I'm after is verse 11, in order that no advantage be taken of us, in or, and we're going to discuss that in a minute, by Satan. Look, the, and listen, the us is the larger group that wasn't involved in his sin, but took what Paul, and, and finally Paul said, look, you've got to withdraw fellowship socially from him. didn't do the right things on the back side of it. Now you got a, you got you had a problem on the front side. Now you got a back side, but you have the back side of it is bigger than the front side because the first side was only one member. Now we got the whole church. Right? The whole church. 
And so he says, and that's what he's talking about. And so when he says, in order, no, no advantage to be taken of us by Satan, the church has got to get back in the right mindset with this person. Because, listen, the church should be open to all people who want to find out the solution to sin, right? And they go like, well, well boy, this is tough. Okay, so you you got you got to be able to explain your behavior to the unbeliever and the, the other people, the people that are not church that you're wanting to be churched in. And so he tells us, in order that no advantage be taken of us, the congregation, by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. And that word schemes is where we're going to go with military strategy. Okay, so let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into this study. We'll look at it a little more technically and then get into it. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study it nor apply it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin, mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue and avert sins would be three categories that you should examine through your own priesthood tonight before study. Because you can't study the Bible in carnality, confession of personal sin, as I mentioned, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the key for the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach us truth, and truth is what we're after. Truth is what sets us free from the cosmic system of lies. John 8, 44, the devil's a liar, and we need to be sure he takes no advantage of us because he's sure that's sure his motive and so our father we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and by internet we pray the holy spirit will minister the truth of this angelic warfare strategy of the devil that we be aware of it always aware of it uh, as paul mentions in the corinthian church out of first corinthians and second corinthians for we've made our prayer in jesus name amen Notice at the top of your paper, we're talking about war, war strategy in the angelic conflict. Um, in our verse, 2 Corinthians 2.11, having explained a little bit of the background to that verse, he op Paul opens in order that no advantage. Notice that's a negative purpose that's identified. That's that. That word no is may. It says me. There should be a line above the E to identify that as a negative. In order that negative person, no advantage be taken of us. This is why he says, look, we got to come back. We got to have, we've got to ex manifest love and all that on the backside. That no advantage be taken of us. Now, this word advantage is really interesting. And, um, it's got two parts to this meaning of this word. You need to pay attention closely to me with it because it's an unusual, this unusual word um, in the verbal form. Normally, this word is not in a verbal form. This is in a verbal form. It ends in an eo. It means <coughs> to seek to get more. That's a literal idea. It means to seek to get more. Uh, or to get an advantage, to get an advantage, to get an and advantage, advantage. Now, behind this, this word is used in the Greek language also for covetousness. So when you have this word, you have the motive that pushes this. The motive is covetousness. Now, understanding that, let me tell you how this word, again, is translated. It means to seek to get more. Now, it could be a positive or it could be a negative. But this word is typically used as a motive of covetousness. That would be the negative side. Is this got, is, are we looking at a negative? Are we looking at a negative? Yeah, the word may. I, and I wrote it, a negative purpose. So when we have it in the negative, this word, then the motive is identified with it. Okay. 
in order that no advantage be taken of us by who by who plus the ablative of the agent is interesting. I mean, he the word by in the English. I, I don't know how other other translation would, but that's an unusual translation, except that this is the ablative of agency. All these different words like ablatives and all of that, they have, ablative means to be separated, but they have different spins off from them. And the ablative can be substitutional. It can be, there's a lot of different, there are a lot of different twists to it. And this is one of those because there's a person identified here, Satan. So in order that no advantage, and we this is a word the, to, get, to get an advantage on somebody or something is, okay, we know it's a negative, so it's a negative word. So the motive behind it, behind this word is covetousness. In order that no advantage be taken of us by the agent Satan, and there's a definite article with his name, which identifies him as the one that we know about, Satan. He's talking about the person. Um, so that no advantage be taken of us by Satan. So he looks for motive. For why Christians do what they do, they look for motive. And I can tell you how important motive is. <laughs> this, was, this was what was behind with, with Eve. He goes through and gives her a little, runs a little test on her. To check her motive. I mean, he asked her a biblical question. We'll get to it, but he asked her a biblical question about what she'd been learning at Bible study. And then he began to listen to her to see where her motive was for what she was thinking. Her motive. And and he worked off that. He from that point on, he he worked her. Um just telling you. This shouldn't be difficult for you. If you're a, if if you've been burnt a couple of times with people, you know what I mean. You become Inspector Cruchot or somebody. Every time you meet him, you become a, a respecter of persons because you got burnt. So your antennas go up, and you do a lot more. You do a lot more examination on people, and you know what you're you know what you're primarily looking for? Motive. Well, how fortunate you are never have gotten burnt. You've lived a long time and gotten not got burnt. That's a pretty good deal. I'm just telling you that after a while you begin to be a checker of motives. What's behind this? I mean, he's uh, what? What's behind it? What's right? The devil is a master of of of. He's a he's a real master of people watcher, and he's figured out how we operate. Motive is a big deal. It works off that. In order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan. Now watch. And here's how he doesn't, he's not able to do it. For we are not ignorant of his schemes. It has the definite article with this word noima. Noima. Now that's from the word noose with the suffix ma on it. And when it's used this way with the definite article in the Greek language, it's dealing in this in this case, we, we're in the angelic conflict, agreed? And we got Satan on the move, right? And he's 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 come in the back door to destroy a church. Come up through the back door, not the front door. Came through the back door. You understand that? I mean, he already had the front door blocked. <laughs> He's working on the back door. He's working on, he got the guy, now he's working on the congregation. 
right? Because this here is about Satan trying to get after the congregation. All right. And this word schemes. See, schemes is not a bad idea when you talk about mentality. But what this word is really about with Satan, and is, it's about strategy. It's about military strategy, because we know that from Ephesians 6. And this word in the Greek language carries the idea now because we got military strategy of warfare, right? So what we have is a strategy, a plan designed by the mind, by the thinking for warfare. That's why we call it the angelic conflict. It don't matter if he's dealing with one person or with a whole group of people. That's his strategy. Okay? And so this is where we got war strategy of the angelic conflict. God has given us, listen, here's what I love about the way God works with us. Here's what I love about it. Always open test, and he always gives you the answers before the questions. Everything God does in your life is an open book test. And he never gives you a test unless he's given you all the answers for it up front. Now, this would be like in football since we're in the season of the coach having the game book on offense and defense on the opposing team. Know every strategy they're going to have on offense and defense. Now, they're pretty good at that now because of films. Films and sending scouts out on specific things to look for. But imagine if you had the whole deal. I mean, it's bad because if you get caught with that kind of stuff now, you could be out of football, couldn't you? I mean, the penalty for that, could you imagine the penalty for that in the SEC? I mean, that'd be, that'd be a death blow. I mean, if they didn't put you out of football, they would put you out of recruiting, which would put you out of football, wouldn't they? That'd be pretty serious stuff. How, because how big is that? The game book. Listen, when you watch a game, because people are so good at reading this stuff, they block everything. They got people around. I mean, They what? The, yeah, sure they do. And and people with binoculars and everything, they're reading, they, they got, they're trying to listen down on conversations and everything. Uh, but if you get caught. So here's what I'm saying to you. God, God has given us Satan's game book. We know everything. If you study the Bible, we know everything. Er, we know how he fights offensively and defensively. We know his whole strategy. We should never get whipped by the devil. God has given us Satan's game book with every scheme of offense and defense so that, listen to me, so that we are not ignorant of his war strategy, right? I mean, this is what this verse tells us. Now, I want you to go over to 2 Corinthians, where, if you're still there with me, to the 10th chapter. And I wrote a few things down for you because he brings this up again in the 10th chapter uh, of war strategy. And I'm looking at verses 3. We'll start with verse 3 and go through 5. Maybe go through 6, something like that. I'm looking for, just try to get through the passage. For, for though we walk in the flesh, No, he's not talking flesh in this way. He's talking about it in a natural sense of flesh. We walk in the flesh, right? Now, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not flesh. You know, like when he opens Ephesians book and talks about warfare in the chapter 6, he says flesh and blood. That's what he means here. We don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and forces of wickedness in heavenly places, right? That's what he's talking about here. 
when he in verse three, in verse four, for the weapons. Now he goes to weapons. See, he's talking about war in war in verse three, weapons in verse four. Right. Stay with me now. OK, for the weapons of our warfare. Now he goes into great details about weapons at, in Ephesians 6, doesn't he? He, he? he brings them out, brings it out, and tell, talks about it. For the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, like flesh and blood, but divinely powerful. And, and he's talking about the positive here. He's talking about us. But divinely power, our, our warfare weapons, ours. You see that? Our, our, but our warfare, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Now, in the ancient world, that was everything. Look. I mean, everybody knows Jericho, right? Israel and Jericho. It was the most fortified city. I mean, when you read the strategy of the city, to fortify themselves, it was imp it, it it was impossible. Okay, from a military standpoint. Now we know there's no such thing as impossible from a military standpoint. I mean, you can you can get a horse, build a horse, and put a bunch of people in it, and take it in. I mean, <laughs> you know. But in the minds of the people who build it, and the minds of the people who tried to attack it, it it was nearly impossible. And God comes up with Israelites. They're not prepared for the military. They're not prepared to do that. They're not prepared to stay that long. They're just traveling through. They're going to become farmers. They're just traveling through. And they go around Jericho. And what is impossible for man is not impossible to God, is it? And we know that story. See, the point I was making, it was identified as a fortified city. And when you say a fortified city, it means they, as far as the people who have fortified it, they believe that they've got the best weapons, the strongest army, yada, yada, like, like America talks, like Russia talks, like China talks, right? And as soon as somebody gets something better, they've got to come up, and up one on them because this is what warfare is about. Now, warfare has changed a lot from fortified, but we still have the same concept. All right. Now, but here's ours. Listen, here's the key word. It's not that it's fortified. Listen, it's not fortified. It's the idea of divinely powerful. See, and that's why I went to the story of the city of Jericho, fortified city of Jericho. So he says, uh, our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses like Jericho. God is the same God. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that fortresses change, but not, but not the divine power. Do you see? Fortresses, fortresses, defensive positions and military stuff, but God is still the God of divinely powerful. There is no fortress greater than divinely powerful. You with me? And our the weapons of our for listen to me now. The weapons of our warfare, Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, are what? Please tell me you know. This, this is an open book test. They are what? Divinely powerful for what? For destroying fortresses. The, that is the best. Listen, a uh, fortress is that is the strongest defensive system that can be set against us. You know what I used to love about old SEC? I mean, you had games that were won by three points. I mean, it would be zero, zero, zero all the way to the end. Now you were just trying to get close enough to get a field goal. We didn't have kickers back then that could kick 62 yards. We were just trying to get within a 30, 35 yard line to kick that sucker through and win. Why? Because they had a great defense. They were fortified. They had a great defense. Doesn't mean they couldn't be beat. But 
You couldn't beat him. You couldn't beat him on the ground. You couldn't beat him through the air. You hope you got a kicker can kick at 35, 40 yards, and you could go home with a win. We have that win every time. We have that win every time. Why? Because the weapons are our warfare are what? Come on, people. Divinely powerful for what? Destroying fortresses. Okay. It's a tough night. We've had busy. We've had some tough days. I can see that. Wednesday has been tough. I'm going to give you a break. For we are destroying. Now watch what the fortresses are. We are destroying. Here are the fortresses. Speculation. See, it, it's, all about the, it's all about the mind and the heart. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge. Watch this now. The knowledge of God. You see, it's always the war. What, 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 the very first war that Satan fought in the human race was against what? Knowledge of God. The tree of what? Knowledge of God. The tree of what? Knowledge of God. And that warfare continues. Everything, the, the speculations and the lofty things raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought because that's what's important in this. This is the fortification. Every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. See, that was a key word over in 2 Corinthians 2 you may have not paid attention to. And we are taking every thought. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever, whenever your obedience is complete. And so, listen to what Paul has told us. Listen to what Paul has told us. Here's Paul's pep talk for the big game. This, you know, there's two times you get a pep talk. Well, there's actually three times we used to get pep talk. We'd get one before we went to the ball game. We got one at halftime, and we got one on one Monday morning. <laughs> Monday morning. I hated those. Now, here's what he told us about strategy and warfare in the angelic conflict. First of all, this war is not flesh and blood. It's an angelic conflict. So stop fighting flesh and blood. You, you're fighting the wrong thing. And we spend most of our time fighting flesh and blood. So we gotta we gotta stop that. Don't don't do this, right? That's not where the war is. You think it is, you're wrong. So stop doing that. Stop doing it in your marriage, stop doing it in your family, stop doing it in your church, stop doing it. Our weapons are not designed for the flesh. They are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Our weapons are for spiritual warfare. It's, it's our strategy. Our weapons are designed for the destruction of fortresses, which is described as every speculation and lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and taking captive every thought. And we're back to Noima. Noima. Where did you see Noima? Right up in my beginning where it says schemes. See the word schemes at the very top of your paper? Now we got it. There it is again. Well, I want to talk about, as me, I'm gonna, I've got four down. We'll see where we go. My introduction was a lesson, was it, Shirley? It's about time to go home, isn't it? If I thought you had gotten this, it, we could go home if I thought you got this. <laughs> but, of course, I don't know, so i got to go on. A lesson. Here's what we're going to look. Here's what he's got. Here's, here's his strategy. Attack human volition, free will. Attack your belief system. Maximize 
your lust especially of the mind and minimize your risk and consequences and the fourth thing is to get you to exchange faith for sight if he can get you walking in sight listen to me here's what he'll do he'll put the fear of the wrath in you listen to what he'll do he'll take somebody that is six feet tall and turn him into a grasshopper just with the mind right remember the spies that went in and everybody come back with a report we're the size of grasshoppers That's his strategy. And what did that? Well, the Bible was very clear what did that when the 12 spies went out and came back with their report. They were scared to death. And the more they were in the land and looked at what was there, he got them into fear, and fear put, put them down. They went down. By the time they got back, they were the size of grasshoppers by their own words. It's a grasshopper mentality. Psychology even used it when I was studying it. They used that. They talked about the fear system in man. They had a, they had a thing they called the grasshopper philosophy. So we're going to look at human volition. We're going to look at the belief system. We're going to look at how he, what he maximizes and minimizes. We, not, we must not play that game. And and how he gets us to exchange faith for sight. He did it with Eve. We'll see it. One of Satan's stra strategies of warfare involve attacking human volition. See, that's the key in the angelic conflict, is it not? It is the key. Human volition, free will. That's the deal. This is why it's, it's why he's got free reign over the human race. God don't believe he can do it. I don't know what the success rate in it is, but every once in a while he gets a job, doesn't he? Hopefully he gets them. Listen, the only thing that got Job made him the guy he was, was he, he studied the word of God when he had opportunity. And when the time came to apply it, he, he stepped up and did it. You know why? Listen to me. He took every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. How, how many thoughts? How many thoughts? Not every. Not just some. Not the ones we like. Not cherry picking. This becomes very clear when you study Satan's attack upon the first humans, Adam and Eve, that volition is the key. He is now confident, is what that should be. He is now confident that members of the human race can be persuaded to act against the revealed will of God. We call it the directive will. I do. I call it the directive will of God. That, that would, listen, listen, everything in your life is, the key is not the will of God in a large, general, generic way. It's the specifics that he's after. He didn't go over the general. Hey, you go to Bible study, quit going to Bible study. He didn't do that. He went, what you studying in Bible study? You know what, what? You know what he got it down to the directive will of God about the tree that they were told not to eat from. Eh? He got them right down, right down. To, listen, it was the only commandment they had from God. They had one commandment from God, a negative one. Don't. They had a positive one in sixteen. Go eat from all the trees, whatever you want. Therefore, your, therefore your enjoyment. But in the tree, the tree in the middle, you don't eat. The day you do, you die, right? Dying, you will die. It's no different. Listen, this is the way he fights. It's no different in your life. Once the, once the directive will of God is revealed to you and you buy into it, it it's, now, it's now fair game. Why? Volition. Will you become obedient? Will you take every thought to the obedience of Christ? You know, you 
know, the, you know where this game is hard, hardest to be played is in your home, in your marriage, in your family, in your business when things get tough. Are you willing to stop fighting in the flesh and regroup and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and then come back to the warfare? Because you got, listen, your weapons are divinely powerful, but not in the flesh. They're not designed for the flesh, right? Satan was able to keep Adam and Eve on their heels or on defense because they, w they did not cycle the truth of the word of God by faith against every attack. Yeah, people don't pay any attention to how many times he attacked Adam and Eve. I guess you just think it was one little deal and, and he's... he's he, listen, how many times, did, listen, he, did, he, he attacks you, he, he, he's going to look for another, he don't quit, he's going to play four quarters on you. It, he don't pay any attention to the score, it's, it's who wins. He don't pay any attention to the score, he just plays to win. If he thinks he can run the score up and get you l relaxed so he can get you in the end, it's, it's, it's who wins. Not, it's not what the score is in the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter. It's, it's who wins. I remember one time I went to the, I took all my kids to Sanford's game. Um, they, had, uh, they had just brought in um, this Bowden boy that went to Auburn. He brought him a hot shot quarterback with him into Sanford. He put Sanford on the map. That first year, he put Sanford on the map, and he was done. And they were in champ championship, and they brought a big team came into Sanford to play for playoffs. So I got all my kids, got tickets. I said, we're going to the alma mater business, we're going to Sanford. We're going to have a good time out there, you know, 5,000 people. It was like a high school football game in the South. And uh, that team jumped on us. And they had us down like five touchdowns at halftime. I was so upset at that stupid ball game. I loaded up the kids. We loaded up the whole family. I couldn't take another half. I, I, I wouldn't have been worth teaching anything. I mean, and boy, did God teach me about quit that foolishness. But anyhow, that's where I, where I was. We loaded up in the car. The kids, of course, didn't want it. They were just having fun, right? They didn't care who won the ball game. <laughs> the guy in my family cared. But I couldn't take it. I would take one more score on us. So we packed up at halftime. I convinced him that we, on the way home we would stop and get something good. And um, the kids said, well, well, let's listen to it. I said, okay. And Sanford came back and won that ball game. And those kids still talk about that at our table. When we talk about go, going to a ball game or what do, well, don't take dad. <laughs> if you go, if we're all like Ty's now playing out at Chelsea, so they're planning to go all out, you know, to support him at out of Chelsea game. And they say, well, don't go with dad because he'll leave when things get bad. <laughs> so don't do that. And so th this is what Satan lives for is that kind of foolishness. Paul instructs us, you remember when we did Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, Paul instructs us three times to stand firm. I really emphasize that to you. And you know what standing firm is? Defense. You stand firm on defense. You hold them, you hold them, and you hold them. And when you get that opportunity, you strike Stand firm is a defensive, not offensive. Offensive is charge. <laughs> it's not stand. It's charge. Let me tell you, all, all the weapons of your warfare are defensive except one. That's the word of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. <laughs> he instructs us to be patient, to wait for opportunity to strike with confidence of categorical Bible doctrine, that's the key. There is where the directive will of God, which is absolutely what is under attack. 
he hit Jesus three times, right? Hit him three times in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. You know what is always, always hitting, looking for motive. You go back and study and look what he was looking for motive out of Jesus Christ. He didn't get it. You know what he got? He got the motive of God out of the word of God. He's, he was looking for human motive to attack Jesus. Oh, I see where you're hungry. Oh, I see where you're ambitious. Oh, I see. Looking for motive. Go back and read that. You'll find it very interesting. The, it'll help you understand how he attacks us. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve know how to use offensive. They did not know. It should be negative. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve did not know how to use offensive weapon, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Listen, here's, here's what we say. We say this all the time. They had the talk, but they didn't have the walk. Oh, they talked it, but they didn't walk it. When push comes to shove, they caved. Here's the second point. A second angelic strategy, angelic conflict strategy of the devil involves your belief system. Listen to Matthew. Jesus explained this in Matthew 13 in the parable of the solar, sower, verse 9. He said, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, such as you are here tonight, and does not understand it, I'm going to come back to that. The evil one, look out, always pay attention to how the devil is described in a passage. The evil one, we know what his motive is. The evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one, this is the believer, who, or this is the, uh, the ground whom seed whom seed sown beside the road, the pathway or the road. Okay? Now look at it. Let's go back up to that bold print. Anyone who hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, it has the negative may, and it, it, this, this verb that's used here is made up of two words. It's the preposition so, soon, which is like sun, S-U-N, soon. And it's the word imi, which is an absolute status quo verb of existence. This word means to have it together. You know, you hear people say, have you got it together, right? Talking about emotions and plans, whatever. Have you, have you got it together? Keep it together. Don't, don't fall apart. Keep it together. This is this word. It, 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 you might hear people say, let's, let's get on the same page. They all, these are all euphemisms for this idea. Uh, uh, being able to put things together and, and see what's really happening. You, you, you may not, so, but you, you're puzzled. But I'm a little puzzled about this. Let me think. And so your mind says, well, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. You go like, ah, aha, aha, I see. It's putting it, it's putting it together so that you're on the same page with God. The, and it's translated, he hears the word of God, he's open to hearing it, but does not understand it, which means he's not able, he's not able to put it in, in the same place that God wants it in his scheme of life. He pushes back on it. He's pushing back on it. He hears it. He wanted to hear it. He heard it because God wants to. God wants to rearrange some furniture in his life. He pushes back on it. When the, and when he pushes back on it, then the devil sees motive. There's motive behind that for whatever it might be. There's definitely motive. He pays attention to the motive. He don't pay attention to push back. He pays attention to motive. When he, when he does it, then he snatches it from him. Now, now he's got he's got you. Because you're not listen to me. Because you're not on the same page with God, concerning what God wants you to do. Because you're not on the same page with God with what He wants you to do. Because you're not on the same page with God with what He wants you to do, and He's revealed it by His Word. You're not able, nor are you willing, to take captive every thought. To the obedience of Christ. In regard to that issue. You understand? On that issue, you're not willing to do it. You're not, you're, you're not willing to do that. 
And he and then he sees motive behind that. I mean, that, you know, he goes like, Ching, well, why is he doing that? He's a master psychologist because his whole principle is to deceive you. I mean, motive is everything. He, he'll play motive. A motive is what he looks for. And there's no way to hide that. No way. Not in the angelic conflict. So, in, I put down Hebrews, and this, uh, this will be well worth your read, Hebrews 4, 1 through 3, and then verses 11 and 12. Because he's talking about being able to be, always being in, no matter what's going in your life, always be in a position of rest. Faith rest. Always be in a position of rest. Then he, he warns you, in this passage, it's very important. He warns you, don't fall short. Don't fall short. I mean, you can have a great run uh, on uh, third down or fourth down. You can have a great run, everything executed perfectly. If you don't get that first down, you, you've, you've fallen what? Short. You've fallen short. So this is the point the writer is trying to make to us in this passage. When we come to 2 Corinthians 11, 3, and Paul is describing his understanding of what went on in the garden with Adam and Eve and Satan, I am afraid, least as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. You know what craftiness is? It's the ability just to see human nature as it is in its raw state and look for motive. Look for motive. Jane loves murder she wrote. She loves this old lady that does that. The elderly lady, I'm sorry. Is she 102? Well, she don't look like it. <laughs> well, anyhow. In all the cases, they're always talking about motive, right? It's all about motive. They look at the crime scene. They do all this. They do all that. Well, and so they start eliminating people. Uh, on the first wave, is they look for motives to eliminate people, right? And when the motive's not there, then this thing gets very difficult, doesn't it? But there's a, but they're still looking for motive because they're looking for someplace else. It's always about motive. Our judicial system runs on it, doesn't it? Motive. And and. And listen, I'm afraid at least the serpent deceived Eve by what? Craftiness. Craftiness. Um, the, 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 I used to hear people in our generation, Johnny, you may be just a little older than I am. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just teasing with you. Uh, when you get to pull, but you can tease with me. You won't be this one, though. You won't get this one to tease me. Um, you used to hear people say, silver-tongued devil. You ever heard that? Yeah. He's just a silver-tongued devil. You ever heard that? Where were you to hear that? Oh, I was, wait. <laughs> I was looking for motive again. Um, that's the devil. Silver-tongued devil. He could, you know, you could, he could sell what to Eskimos? Huh? Right. We know what the... the that says. No telling what if you ask a kid today that no matter what, it, it would be unreal what answer you get. Don't you imagine? Sure wouldn't be a refrigerator, though, would it? Or when I first heard it, it was called an icebox. Oh, you children. I'm afraid, Lisa, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. You see how many times Christ comes up in the issue here of the angelic conflict? I love that passage. And he's talking about Genesis 3rd chapter. Peter's an example of this doctrinal principle in Matthew 16, 21 through 23. And that's a famous one around here. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. 
that, that's really interesting in itself, that word stumbling block in concept of what was going on in the angelic conflict. You are not, watch this now, you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but on man's. Yeah, that's a, that, that gets us all, buddy. I mean, this is not, this is not deep psychology here. This, this is how he gets all of us. You're not setting your mind. And you know how he gets to that place? He looks for motive. Satan attacked Eve's belief directly. Watch us now. He attacks Eve's beliefs directly, but he attacks Adam's indirectly. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he did. Apparently, Satan couldn't get Adam. Apparently, I don't know. But Satan couldn't get to Adam to do his will, so he got his wife to do it. How about that? Did his wife get him to do it? Yes, yeah, she did. And so we learn it. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'll leave that one alone. I'm going to leave that one alone. But, by the way, he tried to get Job's wife to do it, didn't he? Tried to attack him through her, through her on, the, on the concept of integrity. She said, throw it out. He said, you, you, you talk. I forget how he said it, but something like you talk like a fool, but I don't know if he actually used that word, but similar to that. And, and, and you ought to write that. that it says Job, the second chapter, verse 9 and 10. I doubt, did I put that on your paper? Oh. Did I put 1 Corinthians 7, 4 and 5? Oh. I spoil you people. You don't know anything about writing anymore. R Rick does. I don't know if he's doing crosswords or not, but he writes a lot. I never get to see his paper, though he hides it as soon as the class is over. He's probably saying he says it's a dummy. Um, listen, apparently, say, but, but, but Satan got to the serpent. Listen, listen to the system over there, because we know this story so well, Adam and Eve. Listen, Satan got to the serpent, the serpent got to Eve, and Eve got to, I said go to, but got to, Eve got to Adam. See, listen, listen to me. Alan, here's the name of the game winning. <laughs> I got to win. Oh, if I have to use the water boy, the cheerleader, I got to win. Whatever I can do to distract the players, I got to win. It's all about winning because it's in the angelic conflict and it's all about him and God. Point three the third angelic strategy that he uses is to minimize the, the lust of the mind while minimizing the risk and consequences of it. He, he's got an agenda. He, you've got to, he, you, he's, you, there's a way to bait you and lure you. Did Eve have lust? You think Eve had it? Yeah. She didn't have a sin nature. You think she had lust? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. You guys are so smart. This is so good. Here's one, 1 John 2, 16. For all that's in the world. You know, that's, that's the system, not the earth. Everything that's in the, on the earth system, the system, the world system, that's what Satan operates. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, it is from the world. Now, pay attention to the lust of the eyes. Genesis 3, 6, when Eve saw, this is after Satan has, a, a, has got, got her hooked. He's got her on the hook trying to get her in the boat. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, was the tr listen, was the, listen, was the tree of knowledge ever designed for food? Never, never done. He said, listen, he made it very clear in verse 16, all the trees in the garden, are for your are for your pleasure. 
for your eyes, your foot, everything. Everything in there, eat. But if this tree don't what? Not eat. The rest of the trees, they're for your pleasure. You can sleep on them. You can climb in them. You can pick flowers from them, put them in your hair. You do eat, eat, eat. You don't have to worry about weight. Got all this covered. Wouldn't that be nice to be just to eat your heart's content? I don't know. I'd have to see those trees first. Look at what she saw. Good for food. Were they good for food? No, where'd she get that? Lust of the eyes. Look, see the word saw? That's not what she got in her hand. Hmm. Not yet. She's about to eat. Yeah. That, no. It shows her motive to eat. You'll see at the moment. The woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise. Now, where did she get all that information? Well, hello. She took from the fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband who was with her. You ought to circle that. Boy, there was a guy who didn't step up the plate, right? There was a guy who was already casualty of warfare. Good lesson for all of us guys. And then he ate. Now, I don't have time tonight to explain this to you, but I want, I want you to do something. Just for your own exercise, a crossword puzzle. Satan told Eve three, uh, told her, uh, gay, uh, five things. Takes a village, doesn't it, to get me through a Bible lesson. Takes a village. Imagine what I'm going to be like when I'm 90 up here. And I won't be standing here at 90. Well, I don't know. I may be setting. I don't know. It's me and you. It's nobody else. It'll be me and you. Five things. And listen, there are five things. I want you to see if you can find them. In verse 1, 4, and 5, he tells her five things. He attacks her with five issues. Here's his strategy. Now, I, I bet I didn't write this down in your paper. So you got a pen? Right here, I want you to write. What Satan does, he parses the truth. Parse. Gee whiz. I wrote that on your paper. I know. There you go. <laughs> and you do. Listen, and you do, and I'm so thankful. Okay, listen, he parsed the truth. That's, what, that's his game. He parses it. He, 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 he takes a little bit, and then he spins it his way. And you watch for that. Verse 1, 4, and 5, you watch for that. Because here's the secret. Can you separate lies from truth? I meet a lot of Christians that can't do that. You can hear it when they talk. They believe they can lose their salvation. They're, they think they can, they can be, that law and grace can be compatible. They're, they're compatible. They're not. They're opposites. It, it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me. Listen, the only way you can separate truth from lies is to know the truth. Right? You got to know the truth. It is the truth that sets you free, sets you free from the cosmic lies. Because listen, no matter how the devil plays the game, he's a liar. He's a deceiver. And he's a master at it. He's got the human psyche down. He's had a long time to practice the human psyche. He's got that thing down. And listen, the human psyche, because creating the image of God, it works in every nation, every language. Same, th same, same old deal. No matter what the color of the skin, no matter what language they speak, we're all made the same way. 
You see, the greater issue in the angelic conflict, like Adam and Eve, was God's truth, not God's truth. See, he tries to get us looking one way, and the next thing you do, he's, 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 he's pulled a magic deal on you. It wasn't really magic. It was a sli slight, wasn't it? A slight of the hand. It wasn't, wasn't magic. It wasn't miraculous. He's got you looking one way and clubs you with, from another way. He just clubs you. The issue in the garden with Adam and Eve was, the, was God's truth. What is truth? See, he's, he lies. It's always about what is truth and what are lies. It, it, it's not complicated. It's very simple. And listen, he's, he's not going to be permitted to tell you a lie. He has to get permission to tell you stuff. You, you understand that? He can't, come in, he can't come into your periphery without permission. He can't come into your, Horton calls it, your six feet of space. He can't come in without permission. You know why? There's a hedge. There's an electric fence around you, a divine electric fence. <laughs> the other day I was out on a little farm. I didn't pay any attention. I saw a mule over there in the background walking. And I thought, and you know, when they see somebody there, they put their head up and their ears go up and they just, uh, and so I thought I'd just walk over a little bit. There was a fence. I thought I'd walk over and um, oh, I don't know what I'm saying. So I talked to a donkey. I know, I know, it worked for me. <laughs> well, I tell you, it didn't work for me that day, but I did get something from it because when I walk up to the fence, I, I leaned over on that fence to talk to that stupid donkey, and that fence was hot. <laughs> and I had realized then that I had walked in do grass. And I lit up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> that should never happen to a farm boy. And I just heard all the angels in heaven laughing. That farm boy. Look at that stupid donkey got him. Donkey got him. A donkey. The, and finally, closing out, the fourth angelic strategy is to get the believer to exchange. This is his goal, to get us to exchange walking by faith to walk by sight. We are to walk by faith, not by sight, and so that's his big deal. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, a delight to the eye, Desirable to make one wise, right? That's sight. All sight. All sight. Had her. All sight. Satan banks his, his warfare strategy. The, the, he banked his war strategy on Adam and Eve on the fact that they would not cycle the word of God by faith without getting any anticipated tangible benefit from it. He got him to do it. I mean, he teased him with all that it, 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 it had the possibility. Oh, this has the possibility. And they bought in. She bought into that whole package of possibilities and none of it. He, he can't produce any of it. His, he can't give you anything, not even the sweat off his back. Give you anything? can't give you anything. He gives you just a big, oh, I've been had at the end. <laughs> so anything you get from him. <laughs> I guess, I don't know. I haven't heard him personally say that, but <laughs> I'm thinking. The only thing you get from it is what they got, divine discipline. So, we are destroying speculation and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ would be our message. 
All right, guys, thanks a lot. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get out of here. Do what you do on Wednesday night. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these come our way, both by automobile and Internet. For those who are in a local position tonight, Father, I, I pray that they would understand there is more importance than just the Bible taught here tonight. That's not why we just, that's not the only reason we assemble. There's a good reason why we're told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You think the people that have drove all their distance in here tonight didn't have a tough day and are not tired? And why did they come? There is more in Bible study than just the Bible study. There are spiritual gifts. There is spiritual fellowship. There's, there is the body of Christ assembled. For those on the internet, we thank you for dropping in because you can't drive in here. You live more than 40 miles away, but we think that anybody that's 30, 40 miles away can drive. They do it for other things. It's all about value. But there, there, there is more reason to assemble than just to get some information. That's the importance of a local church. I pray you put it on the hearts of people. Sure, we're tired. Who's not tired at 6.30, from 6.30 to 7.30? Who doesn't want to shut it down and relax? We come to Bible study because we know one thing that apparently people have forgotten. It's a wonderful thing you do with the word of God, Father. You refresh us. You refresh our souls. Many a night I have come to Bible study tired and I've left where I couldn't go to sleep because I was so excited what my soul had experienced in the study among the people. The things that I had heard in the fellowship I'd had that carried prayer away from that group that I would never have known about had I not had the personal experience. Our people, Father, our people, our doctrinal studies people within that 30, 40 mile radius have a great opportunity. We still live in the day of freedom in our nation, which is a wonderful privilege. Today I watched the funeral, Father, of a, of, of a great warrior. No matter what he was as a politician, he served the military of our, our, our United States of America with great nobility, a great American attitude of victory, never victim. And while we have this freedom, we should take advantage. Rick goes off on missionary trips, and he comes back, and people, people walk for miles. They, they sleep in whatever facilities they can find. They... They do whatever they can uh, to hear the word of God. Don't even have a Bible. Don't even have any hope of ever having one. Here we sit, fat and sassy in America, as all of this grace privilege is somehow earned and deserved by us, and none of it is. And so I pray, Father, for us. How are we going to invite other people to come with us to Bible study if we don't come? So we encourage our, encourage our hearts to be faithful, to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.